If you've been with us, you know we're deep into power systems physics. Yes, that essential heartbeat of modern life. Exactly. We're continuing our look at power system frequency, that critical 50 or 60 hertz that has to stay stable, you know, 24-7. Right. Today, we're moving beyond just what frequency is. We're diving into the, uh, the actual control systems, the engineering that manages these tiny fluctuations constantly. It really is a constant balancing act. You get a sudden event, maybe a lightning strike or a big factory suddenly goes offline and things can spiral fast if the controls aren't there. Okay. So our mission today really is to break down that hierarchy of defense. We'll look at the four main things keeping the lights on frequency wise, load, inertia, governor control, and then the overarching automatic generation control, or AGC. Okay, a whole operational infrastructure to unpack. Let's start where the power actually gets used, mm -hmm. the load. How does demand itself react when things uh, wobble a bit, like frequency or voltage changes? Well, that's a key point. Load isn't just one monolithic thing. It behaves differently, and we generally split it into two main types. How they react is crucial. Okay, two types. What's the first? First, you've got your non-motor load. Think resistive things, heaters, old-style light bulbs, simple electronics. Their power draw, the megawatts, does change with voltage and frequency. Oh, but for these, voltage is the main driver, much more sensitive to voltage changes than frequency changes. Okay, so if the voltage dips. Right. The numbers are quite telling. If system voltage drops, say, 10%, those resistive loads will actually reduce their power draw by almost 19% instantly. Wow, okay, so down to like 81% of what they were drawing. Exactly. It's a kind of passive built-in cushion. Mm. If voltage sags, demand automatically eases off a bit, which helps stabilize things right away. No computers needed, just physics. That helps with voltage dips, sure. But you said voltage is the main driver for that type of load. Yeah. That suggests the other type is different. Very different. And it's the bigger piece of the puzzle for frequency stability. That's the motor load. Ah, motors. Like in factories, air conditioners, refrigerators. Precisely. Induction motors especially. They make up a huge chunk of the total load. Some estimates put it at 40%, maybe even up to 60% across the grid. Households, industry, commerce, they're everywhere. And how do they react to frequency changes? This is where it gets really interesting for stability. Motor load also varies with voltage and frequency, but for motors, frequency has a much bigger impact than voltage does. Okay. So if the frequency starts to drop. Then the power drawn by all those motors also drops significantly. There's a really useful rule of thumb here. Let's hear it. A 1% decrease in frequency causes about a 3% decrease in the connected motor load measured in megawatts. Wait, 3% just from a 1% frequency dip? Yep. Think about that across a whole grid. If generation suddenly drops and the frequency starts falling. The biggest chunk of the load automatically starts demanding less power. Exactly. That 3% reduction acts like an immediate break on the frequency drop. It's a natural physical self-correction that reduces the imbalance the instant it happens. It buys precious time. That's fascinating. So the load itself provides this passive automatic relief. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What comes next in the defense hierarchy? Next, we move to the generation side and the physics of power system inertia. This is all about resisting change. Like inertia in physics class. An object in motion stays in motion. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It's the stored kinetic energy in all those massive rotating things connected to the grid, the generators, the turbines, even some large industrial motors. They're heavy. They're spinning fast. And that spinning mass doesn't like to slow down or speed up quickly. Exactly. It takes a lot of force, a lot of energy to change the speed of a massive generator rotor. That physical property means the system frequency can't just collapse instantly if there's a problem. The inertia resists the change. So it acts like a kind of shock absorber. If a big power plant trips offline, suddenly there's less generation than load. Right, you have a big imbalance. But the lights don't go out immediately. Why? Because all the other spinning machines on the grid instantaneously give up a tiny bit of their stored rotational energy. How do they do that? They convert some of that kinetic energy into electrical energy to help cover the shortfall. It's like they're all chipping in automatically. Yeah, but there's a cost, right? Yeah. Giving up rotational energy means... Means they slow down. And that slowing down of all the generators is the drop in system frequency we observe. So the more inertia, the slower the frequency drops. Precisely. Low inertia systems are much more volatile. High inertia gives you that crucial buffer, maybe only milliseconds or seconds, but it's enough time for the active control systems to wake up and start responding. Inertia buys time. Okay, so that brings us to the first active control layer, the machinery designed to react. That's the governor control. Yes, the governor. 
You can think of it as the individual brain for each generator unit. Its primary job is to keep the generator's shaft spinning at the right speed. By constantly monitoring the shaft speed and adjusting the mechanical power going into the turbine, if the speed dips, it lets more energy in. If the speed rises, it cuts back. Okay, let's take a steam turbine example. Say a big factory starts up, load increases, the generator starts to slow down slightly. The governor detects that tiny speed drop, and in response, it automatically opens the main steam valve a bit more. More steam hits the turbine blades. More rotational energy goes into the shaft, pushing the speed back up towards the target. It's constantly making these fine adjustments. And it's different for other types, like hydro. Same principle, different mechanism. For a hydro turbine, the governor adjusts wicket gates to control water flow. For a gas turbine, it controls the fuel input. But the goal is always the same. Maintain shaft speed through mechanical input. It's the primary fast-acting frequency control. Right, fast-acting. But here's something that seems odd. If the whole point is to keep frequency dead on, say, 60 hertz exactly, why doesn't the governor just do that? Why doesn't it perfectly correct the speed? Ah, now you've hit on one of the most clever and maybe counterintuitive parts of power system design. The need for droop characteristics. Droop? Sounds like a flaw. It sounds like it, but it's intentional. The perfect control you're describing is called isochronous control, meaning same time or same speed. Striving for perfect instantaneous frequency tracking by every single generator. Okay. So why don't we use isochronous control? Why isn't perfection the goal here? Because if you connect hundreds, maybe thousands of generators together in a grid and all of them try to react perfectly and instantly to the tiniest frequency flutter, well, they end up fighting each other. They're fighting? How? Imagine tiny variations. One governor opens its valve slightly, another closes it, they overshoot, undershoot, you get these power swings, oscillations building up across the grid. It leads to instability, generators shipping offline, potential equipment damage. It just doesn't work in a large interconnected system. Okay, so perfect individual control leads to collective chaos. Mm -hmm. What does Droop do instead? Droop introduces a kind of deliberate sluggishness or comportionality. It forces generators to share the burden of a frequency disturbance in proportion to their size. Proportionally, meaning bigger generators do more. Exactly. A droop setting ensures that, say, a big 1,000 megawatt generator will pick up 10 times more load, or shed 10 times more, than a smaller 100 megawatt unit for the same frequency deviation. Ah, uh, so they cooperate instead of competing. The big units pull the most weight. Precisely. Droop allows them all to operate in parallel, responding to the same frequency signal without stepping on each other's toes. Stability through coordinated, proportional response. How is this droop actually set or defined? It's usually expressed as a percentage. A common value is 5% droop. What that means is the frequency needs to change by 5% of its nominal value. So for a 60 hertz system, that's a 3 hertz change. Which is huge. It is huge, yes. That 5% frequency change is what's required to make the governor move the generator's output from its minimum load all the way to its maximum rated load or vice versa. So for smaller, normal frequency deviations, the governor only moves the output by a small proportional amount. Correct. It ensures that for typical disturbances, the response is shared appropriately across all participating generators. Okay, Droop ensures stability through proportional sharing. But you also mentioned governors have limitations. They can't always respond perfectly, even with Droop. Right. They aren't magic bullets. There are physical limits. Two big ones are spinning reserve and governor deadband. Okay, briefly, what are those? Spinning reserve sounds like backup power. Sort of. It's the unused capacity on generators that are already running and synchronized to the grid. If a generator is already running flat out at 100% power, its governor can signal to open the valve more. But there's nothing left to give, no spinning reserve. Exactly. The governor asks, but the generator can't deliver more power. And governor deadband. Deadband. That's a small range of frequency deviation, maybe plus minus zero. 0 0.036 hertz or something similar, where the governor is intentionally designed not to react. Why ignore small changes? To prevent constant unnecessary adjustments. If governors reacted to every tiny flicker, they'd be constantly tweaking valves or gates, wearing out equipment and potentially hunting back and forth. The dead band means they only respond to more significant, sustained deviations, ignoring the normal small noise. Okay, so governors give a fast, proportional, primary response thanks to droop, but they are limited 
and don't bring the frequency exactly back to 60 hertz. There's always that slight offset because of the droop characteristic. That's the key consequence of droop, yes. They stabilize, but they settle slightly off target. Which perfectly sets the stage for the final layer. Automatic Generation Control, or AGC. This is the system that corrects that final offset. Correct. AGC exists precisely because governors with their droop settings cannot restore frequency perfectly to the scheduled value, like 60.00 Hertz, and also don't consider the economics of which plan should produce power. So AGC acts like the, the fine tuning system, the cleanup crew. You could put it that way. It's the secondary frequency control. It operates on a slightly slower time scale, seconds to minutes, compared to the governor's instant reaction. It looks at the overall balance of generation and load across a whole control area, not just one generator. And its job is to eliminate that small frequency error left by the governors. Yes, and also to manage power flows between different areas. It restores the frequency precisely to the target value, say 60.0 Hertz. How does it do that without fighting the governors? Does it override them? Not directly. AGC doesn't usually fiddle with the steam valves itself. Instead, it sends signals to adjust the load reference set points of selected generators. Ah, so it tells the governor, okay, your new target speed isn't quite 60 hertz anymore. Aim slightly higher or lower based on this new power output target. Essentially, yes. It sends raise or lower pulses to the generators participating in AGC. It might tell one plant, increase your output by 5 megawatts, and another, decrease by 2 megawatts, making slow, calculated adjustments across the fleet. So if the frequency settled at, say, 59.98 hertz after a disturbance, AGC would detect that error and gently signal certain generators to increase their output bit by bit, until the frequency climbs back up to exactly 60.00 hertz. And by doing this, it also resets the governors. Absolutely. It brings the frequency back to nominal, which allows the governors to return to their neutral position, ready with their full range of response available for the next event. It maintains the primary response capability. Wow. Okay, that really clarifies the whole picture. It's this layered defense. It really is. You've got inertia as the instantaneous physical buffer. Then the fast proportional primary control from the governors using droop for stability. And finally, the slower, precise secondary control from AGC to restore the exact frequency target and manage overall balance. A really elegant hierarchical system built up over decades. The most surprising thing for me is still that droop characteristic, intentionally designing the primary control to be imperfect, is actually the key to making the whole interconnected system stable. It shows that sometimes perfect individual action isn't as good as coordinated proportional cooperation, especially in complex systems. Indeed. Okay, to wrap up, let's leave our listeners with something to think about, building on today's discussion. Go for it. We spent a lot of time on inertia that stored kinetic energy in big spinning machines being absolutely vital for buffering sudden changes. So here's the thought. As power grids incorporate more and more renewable energy sources like solar farms or large battery storage systems, which don't have large physical rotating masses like traditional generators. Exactly. How do we replace that essential function of inertia? What provides that instantaneous physical buffer against sudden frequency drops if you don't have tons of spinning steel? That's a major challenge and area of research right now. Synthetic inertia, grid forming inverters, lots of work going on. Definitely something for you to mull over. How do you replicate that fundamental physical property in a grid increasingly powered by electronics? We'll leave you with that until our next deep dive.